G'day folks, thanks for tuning in. In today's video, we'll be focusing on squad painting, using this group of dark troopers from Star Wars Legion. Now we've looked at painting black armoured figures before, which you can see in both the Exploring Black Colour Theory episode, as well as the one on painting Darth Vader. So today I wanted to focus on two different things. The first is how to paint a squad of troops quickly and efficiently, leaning into the strengths of oil paints, and the second is in using black primer. I've had a lot of requests about black primer, I typically paint over a neutral grey primer, both so that you can see what I'm doing, but also because it doesn't interfere much with the hue and value of our paint. But when painting dark figures, particularly ones that are mostly black, it can make more sense to use a similarly dark or black primer. I've got a few colours out on the palette today. As always, it's not important that you match what I'm using, and you can approximate these quite easily with local brands or by mixing. But I have out Titanium White, Radiant Blue, Radiant Violet, Brilliant Yellow Pale, and Radiant Turquoise. Now these all can be made by mixing white into their respective hues, but I like to keep them around as an easy go-to. There are a few red elements such as the eyes, and I'm going to be using Fanchion Red, as well as Cadmium Yellow Medium, for highlights. And for our black, we'll be making a chromatic black out of Indigo and Van Dyke Brown, but any dark blue or brown mix will get you a similar result. I also have Black Spinel, which is a high quality black paint that I don't think I'll be using too much of, but I wanted to have it out as an option. And having a true black paint available, even if it's just ivory black from a starter set, can really help you get those darks just a little bit darker. So let's get started. Firstly, I want to talk about primer choice. Why use black primer? Well, the obvious reason is that the miniature is going to be mostly black, so it makes sense that we would use a similarly black primer. Black primer also has its advantages. We don't have to worry about our recesses as much as we would with a lighter primer, as they'll also be black. It also means that our visible brush strokes, which new oil painters can find challenging, will be far less obvious, especially if our overall piece is going to be quite dark. However, this does mean that our pre-glaze will be harder to see, but we do have ways to get around that. Our colours will also be duller and less saturated over black. Some colours can shift their hue a little bit, such as low-grade yellow paint taking on a green tint, as yellow tends to do when mixed with black. This is why I prime the flame effects in a light grey instead, so you can be a bit strategic with your priming like this. And while I've airbrushed this on, you could just as easily do this with a paintbrush. So next we'll be applying our pre-glaze and adjusting our steps accordingly. To apply a foundational layer or pre-glaze, we'll be using a large beat up craft brush like this one here, where the split bristles really help our paint get down into the recesses, and a cap of odorless thinner to help with flow and adhesion as needed. To make a chromatic black, we can mix some indigo or dark blue with our Van Dyke brown or other dark brown in roughly equal amounts. Now of course when I apply this to the mini, we won't be able to see how it looks, but we can test it on the base room if we haven't painted that already. Another option is to take a paper towel, where we can see that my mix is a bit blue, and I can easily offset with a bit more brown. A third option if you really want it is to take a separate brush and add a little bit of white to the edge of your mix. This will show us what kind of grey it'll become, and is a handy way of assessing the hue of any given mix. But I don't do this often, and for our purposes I think our mix here is fine. Now I'm going to blitz through this step, because truth be told there isn't much to see here. But if you're doing it yourself, you can get a sense of coverage by the obvious glossiness. And by monitoring that glossiness, I can see that I need a bit more thinner, as my foundational layer is not quite getting down into those recesses. How thin we make it and how long we leave it to set are still factors as they are over light primer, as the goal is still to give our subsequent layers something to blend into and work with. So we want to be sparing with the thinner, and only use as much as needed. And when working with chromatic black, the exact ratio isn't as important, because all that variety as we adjust and add to it will make for a more dynamic and interesting result when it comes time to apply highlights. I find too that when working with the squad, warband, posse, whatever your game calls it, particularly one you haven't painted before, that starting with a test figure can really help set us up for success, and you'll see why as we go. So I've let this guy sit out for about 10 minutes to give those colours a chance to stain. Though again the stain is less important given the primer choice, allowing a foundational layer a chance to set will still benefit our subsequent layers. So like usual we can come in with our makeup sponge and start wiping this away. This is so we're left with an essence of that pre-glaze, but not so much that it becomes difficult to work with. With oils, especially in miniature, we want to use as little paint as possible. And you can see by the sponge that we're taking quite a bit away, and we can also see the colour of that pre-glaze. So while it might not look like much, it's definitely going to have an effect. And if we hold it up to the light, you can just see a hint of that brown and that blue, which will make things far more interesting than if we were just to use pure black pigment. So of course this step doesn't take long with a scheme like this, and next we're going to come in and establish some initial highlights, and reap the benefit of that foundational layer. 
To do our initial highlights, we want a fairly large fill with brush, which is essentially a flat with rounded edges. This will let us cover a lot of space quickly and effectively, thanks to its shape and size. I also want to show the difference between pre-glazing and not, as you might think that the primer alone is sufficient. So if I take a bit of white on its own, you can see that it covers fairly smoothly, though it has a bit of a chalky texture to it. But that's nothing that can't be blended later. But the biggest thing I'm noticing is that it's going on uniformly. There's no variation in this white from top to bottom, and while I could subsequently mix things into it and use it as a kind of foundation of its own, it's still quite stark and bland. When we instead apply that same white to the pre-glazed miniature, you can see that it's mixing as it goes on, and as I work from top to bottom, I'm getting a subtle shift in value, which is effectively doing the shading for me. This is still a huge jump in value, perhaps more than we would want for a black miniature, but I wanted to show you the effect of value on the foundational layer. Even with the chromatic black and white combination, there are still some subtle shifts of hue going on, but if I would have used more saturated colours for this, the effect would be even more pronounced. This of course comes down to preference, but I find that since oils make it so much easier and quicker to achieve these effects than acrylic, I like to lean into it. So not only do we get a value sketch with this method, but an overall roadmap for how our piece might look. We can see our potential highlight placement as well as shadows, and now we can easily identify a plan for what we want to do next. And if we're not yet sure, we can easily manipulate this sketch thanks to the long working time of oils. This is another reason to have a test figure, because if I jumped in with this degree of white on all five of them, I wouldn't be happy. So this lets me get a sense of what does and doesn't work. Where we go from here is really up to us. In terms of determining highlights, you could hold your miniature up to a light to get a sense of where the highlights and shadows may fall, and take a picture of it too to have that reference handy. Something else to consider is what environment your miniature is standing in, as that will also influence the look you're going for. These guys will be going on these bases, which I imagine will take place in a desert or a badland, so the light will be quite strong, like that on a sunny day in a wide open setting. So our highlights might be a light blue to represent the open sky, and shadows slightly warm to represent the desert reflecting off this highly polished armour. So next we'll have a play with that idea and see what kind of effect we can get. But before we do that, I first want to re-establish some shadows, because as bright as the environment will be, he's looking far too grey at the moment. So I'll take a small filbert brush and work up some of our foundational colour, which we'll mix in as I apply it. While it still gives us grey, it's a much darker grey, and something we can further darken if we want to. We're also still blocking at this stage, focusing on our shapes as well as our lights and darks. We can also play with some effects like non-metallic metal, which are much easier to attempt with oils by thinking about horizon lines and other places where we could establish that adjacent light-dark light relationship that makes the effect. Painting with oils is a very organic process, and for me it's about leaving room to move, which can lead to a lot of fun experimentation and those famous happy little accidents. Conventional wisdom is that with black and white objects you want at least 50% of that area to be either black or white. This is a solid rule, particularly in miniature, but I find if we make the majority of the space near black or off-white, then we still have that extreme value in our back pocket for the deepest recesses and brightest highlights. Now that he's been toned down a little bit, I want to return to that greater environment and think about getting some blues into the highlights. Now a warm yellow sun would make sense for those extreme highlights, but the vast majority of the environment from above will be that sky, and this will be even more pronounced on surfaces that are reflective, like this whole mini. So we'll take some radiant blue and get to work. If you've seen some of my other videos, you might have noticed that we're not having anywhere near as much of an issue with visible brush strokes, thanks to using a primer more suitable to our colour scheme. Similarly, with those bounce lights coming off the ground, you could take a bit of brilliant yellow pale and make a dark sandy tint and apply them into the downward facing areas. Generally, you want the temperature of your shadows to be opposite that of your highlights. And while we're still imagining this under a yellow sun, I'm instead focusing on that sky-earth relationship, again due to the reflectivity of the armour. Another thing we can do to break up elements is take a little bit of this violet and apply it to the weapons. There's no deep meaning behind this choice other than me wanting to use yet another grey to make one part stand out from another. And since we're painting a squad, once they're all together, all the armour and weapons will be subtly different in the same way. Now to the eye, all of this will largely just read as grey, but the subtle temperature shifts will look more interesting to your brain, as well as a bit more natural, especially once based. At the end of the day, we're trying to create something a little bit more interesting than just a straight black and white figure. So with a bit of back and forth and a bit of patience, we can pretty quickly knock out an interesting scheme. Again, this kind of brushstroke management is much easier this time around, but it's still a very important step in getting a much smoother and refined looking miniature. There's always going to be an ugly phase with oils, but with some practice and experience you can learn to trust the process, and this part I always find to be quite satisfying. For the eyes and chest lights I'm using some Fanchon Red mixed in with a bit of Van Dyke Brown as a base, which will mix in with our greys to further darken it. We can also get a subtle glow going with the same colour, 
adding a bit of red if we wanted to increase the intensity. When doing effects like this, you want to keep the lit areas of value and saturation lower than the light source. You can see more on object source lighting in this video linked above. Pure Fanchon Red is a nice bright rich red, which we could further enhance with a bit of yellow, or a bit of white, or brilliant yellow pale. Yellow will help bring it back if it gets too pink, so have a play with it, knowing you can always come back towards orange or red if you go too far. Depending on the source material, there are several steel coloured sections to these guys, which is another way to break up their shape. A bit of indigo and some white's a decent starting point for this, and again we can apply the same techniques that we do over the black, albeit working at the higher end of the value scale. And as always, penline washes are a quick and effective way to get into those deep recesses to reinforce them, and to emphasise the separation of elements, such as the panels, the joints, and so on. If you want to learn more about washes, blending, adhesion, or any of the techniques I'm talking about today, then I recommend checking out any of my other videos, as they're all frequently used and expanded upon there. By doing a test figure, we've learned some lessons that will make the rest easier to paint. Now we have a plan of attack, we can hit the rest of them in a more production line style. A project like this could still take quite some time, depending on the look that you're going for. So by doing a production line like this, we can save a lot of time and effort. And by breaking our project into sections, such as the highlights, the shadows and so on, we could achieve a consistent result, even if we take breaks in between. I know consistency is a concern for some folks used to painting with very specific pigments, like those found in acrylic, but between the scale of our miniatures and the proximate replication of colours, you'd be hard pressed to tell these apart on the table. And even though I'm being a bit haphazard and messy in places, I'm not being punished for it like we would over a light primer. That's not to say I don't need to clean up, but you can pick your battles like this, and for me getting through these early stages gets me to the parts I enjoy quicker, even if it does result in some double handling. You can get into a real rhythm with batch painting. If you're a fan of podcasts, audiobooks, or like to have the TV on while painting, it can be a chill way to spend the afternoon, again reaping the benefit of having done the test figure. But if you press for time, then oils will stay workable for a couple of days, or even longer if you pop them in the freezer between sessions. But even if they do dry, we can easily resume over the top of it, and sometimes it's advantageous to let them dry, and come back with glazes or freehand later on. If I decide that these guys aren't dark enough, then I can apply a thinned down glaze of my foundational colour, or black, which will act as a filter, and not disturb the work I've already done if they're already dried. Similarly, if I'm practicing freehand, it's much less stressful to know that I can just have a go without worrying about messing anything up. Lastly, I want to spend a bit of time on these flame effects. Given that these guys are going to be outdoors in broad daylight, I don't want much of an OSL effect, and I don't want them so saturated that they distract from the rest of the piece. So I'll start by laying down some titanium white. As white contaminates very easily, I find with something like this where the outer flame is brighter, to start similarly from the top of the value scale. I can then introduce a bit of indigo into the creases, and maybe a bit of radiant blue, to work those colours together. Again, the blending strength of oils is doing a lot of the work for us. I want to try to keep this away from the bottom part, as that'll be more yellow flame, and the white can be a bit funky when working around reds and oranges, so I want to be a bit more precise there. I can then come in with a thinned down version of that white, and tidy up and reinforce the brighter parts closer to the foot. I'm using a bit more thinner as I'm finding it's not quite sticking, but also because I want to preserve as much of that white as possible, which means getting it on there with fewer strokes. The lower flames will be using some white with yellow just to block in that whole section, similarly going for a desaturated look, which the white will provide. I can then come in with some orange, mix some red and yellow, and pick out the cooler parts of the outer flames. I can then add in some brown to get a bit more dramatic contrast going, while avoiding things getting too pink, which would happen if I added too much red. You can spend a lot of time on these sort of effects going back and forth, and they have a tendency to perhaps not look so good at first, but always trust in the process, and just play around, remembering that oils let you move your paint, not just apply it. And here they are all are several days later, and attached to those bases. This group was a lot of fun to paint, and I hope you had fun watching me do it, or at least found it useful. I honestly struggle with batch painting sometimes, so coming up with effective strategies, and really getting the most out of your test figure, are great ways to not only build up your confidence in the project, but making the bulk of the work a lot easier. Picking a suitable primer for your project can also pay dividends, so long as you can adjust to the ways in which the different colours and values influence your paint. So thank you very much for spending time with me here today. If you'd like to see more of this project than others, you can find extended and real-time footage over on my Patreon, as the support of those folks like those whose names are on the screen really help me produce content like this. If you have any questions about the kind of products or techniques I've used today, or you have a topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, I'd love to read about it in the comments. So thanks again for your company, and take care.